So with that, I'm going to introduce our next talk. Uh, going from idiot to imposter. Paul was in the way. Um, give a big stage B welcome to Michael Dales. Thank you, Thank you very much. Okay, so this, this talk, it, despite the fact I'm stood here holding a guitar, is less about guitars and more about trying to get started in a new field, right? So you've come here, you've had a good weekend, you've gone and seen, say, the hacky racers, you've seen the people doing the um, forge, forge work and whatever, and you've kind of look at that and you think, that's awesome, but there's no way I could do that. And that's demonstrably not true, because two years ago, I hadn't done any woodwork since high school, and yet this guitar I'm holding here, I made um, from scratch. So the idea that if you, the idea though is that anyone can do this. And it's just how, how, do you, how do you structure it so that you're likely to succeed and not get frustrated and give up? And that's kind of what this talk is about, and the guitars are just an example for that. So give you some background. This is Guitar Zero. I bought this when I was an undergraduate about in 1996. It was the most expensive guitar I could afford. I think it's the cheapest guitar Fender made at the time. Um, and I, I liked it at the time, but when I got back into guitar playing a couple of years ago, it didn't make the kind of noise I wanted. It kind of, I, back in, back when I was at university, I wanted to be in Radiohead, and nowadays I want to be in the 60s playing blues. Um, so it didn't really kind of match. Um, I thought about tweaking it, kind of taking out some wood and putting in a different kind of pickup, but the most likely outcome of that is I would destroy it and have kindling, um, and I'd be sad. So I decided not to, uh, and I kind of left it there. But then, and this is, this is NASA Ames. I didn't go to NASA Ames for two months, my other half did. Um, but that left me at home with a lot of spare time. Um, and I got more thinking about what were the problems around, you know, overcoming that reluctance to, to uh, do the change. One problem, I, one problem I certainly suffer from is I kind of see polished finished products as atomic. I will look at them. And I, I, if I understand how to do something, I generally think it's easy and trivial, which may not always be true, but that's what I think. Uh, but if I see a finished product and I don't know how to build it, I always assume it's impossible. Um, and, you know, I'm a reasonably competent software engineer, but most video games I look at, because I've never tried to design a game, I think, my god, I could never do that. And that's, again, unlikely to be true, but that's my instinct. So I spent a lot of time trying to demystify um, the electric guitar, right? So I had this kind of finished electric guitar, and I wanted to understand a bit more about how it was put together to get over that initial reluctance to meddle with it. Um, YouTube, um, certainly for, for if you want to get into Lufery, is a fantastic source of that, and I imagine it is for a lot of topics. But just go and like buy books, watch YouTube videos, read wikis, like whatever it is you're interested in. Someone will most likely have written some instructions of how you get there. And the idea isn't you do those instructions straight away. Like, building a guitar is really, you know, is hard. Like, doing the next is re really quite difficult. But the idea isn't you do everything in, in stage one, you iterate. So this is, this is guitar one. This is the first guitar I built. And there's a picture of it. That's what I wanted. It was like my other guitar, only blue, and it had a different pickup. Um, uh, but yeah, I didn't tackle everything in the first go. I cheated. I bought most of the parts, and I, you know, kind of assembled it. The neck I bought, because that's the hard bit. I actually bought the body, but it, I did leave enough to take me out of my comfort zone. So the body wasn't quite right. Um, I would have to do some woodwork to get it into the shape that I wanted. But a lot of it was already done for me, so I was kind of you know, minimizing the amount, I'd go outside my comfort zone to keep it manageable, and everything else I cheated on, and that's fine. Um, the other risk you have with these kind of projects is, oh, I'm gonna invest a lot of money, and if I screw it up, I'll be sad because I've wasted a lot of money. And this approach kind of gives, has kind of two benefits. It kind of, well, so one, I bought the cheapest body possible, which is also why it doesn't work. If you look, um, the kind of, on the uh, right-hand side, there's two potentiometers that should be in that hole, not balancing on top of it. Um, the body literally wasn't fit for purpose. It was so cheap. And there's wood where, in the kind of pickup cavity on the bridge, you can see wood where there shouldn't be wood. And so I had to do some work, but because I spent 20 quid on this and not 200, 400, or however much a finished Telecaster body is, um, 
I didn't care if I destroyed it. I could destroy it 10 times and still kind of be quids in. Um, so there's, and also, yeah, by doing it incrementally this way, I haven't bought all the complicated tools at this point. So if I get halfway through this and decide I'm not doing this anymore, I haven't wasted a lot of investment that I can't get back. So having got the bits, um, I then went to my local community workshop. So this is Cambridge Makespace. Uh, I imagine in this kind of audience, a lot of people are already members of Hackspaces. Um, you know, this is just a, yeah, a Cambridge-based a Cambridge workshop where there's lots of people and lots of toys. The thing that people tend to focus on when they see these is, you know, you've got a couple of laser cutters in there, there's some, a row of 3D printers, there's a glass kiln, there's some screen printing. Um, but that's only half the, the kind of goodness of these places, and the clue's in the name, it's community workshop. The other half is the community. No one at Cambridge Makespace was building guitars, right? So I couldn't go up and ask someone, how, how do you do that? Teach me how to do that. But you would just be around other people building things. You, either they would help you, kind of, they'd see you struggling. Like, I was such a, uh, a you know, such an idiot um, that I didn't know the difference between a posi drive and a Phillips screwdriver until someone saw me struggling and said, uh, yeah, it'll be a lot easier if you just use this other screwdriver, mate. Um, and kind of that, or there was kind of, you know, I could go and ask someone, my soldering sucks because I haven't done it for 20 years, can you teach me how to solder again? And someone took the time to sit down with me and teach me soldering. Um, so, you know, finding a place where there's a community of makers near you that you can go and sit in, even if they don't do exactly what you're doing, is just a, a great way of shortcutting experience. So if you, you know, find whatever your project is, if you can find people working even roughly in the same area, go and hang out with them. Um, it, you know, they will help you in ways that you would never have anticipated. So I did learn a little bit of woodwork. Uh, you know, it would have been 25 years plus since I'd been in a woodworking shop at this point. But I learned how to use a hand router so I could make the holes bigger. I drilled the holes for the string through. Um, and at the end of it, I had this guitar. This was my first guitar. Um, I, who thinks that looks like it could have been in from a shop? Right, a few of you. Uh, so that's success, right? I cheated on most of that, but it's, it, it looks like a finished object, you, and I played that guitar for the next year and a half until I made this one. Um, I never touched my Fender again after that, because not that my original Fender was bad, it just didn't sound like I wanted. I built something and I played it. Um, so that's, that's the first guitar. Now this is also a good point to say, do I really want to do this anymore, right? You don't have to, when you start trying something, it's perfectly valid to say, I've tried it, I don't like it, I'm moving on. Which is another good, I say, the iterative approach to getting into a new domain is a good one because not only do you minimize the kind of, the digression from what you're used to, but it also gives you these checkpoints which you can say, is this good or should I go and do something else, right? So I did decide that was fun, I wanted to do some more. Um, so this is Guitar 2. So, the idea with Guitar 2 is, again, I will just go a little bit more out of my comfort zone than I did with Guitar 1. So, you know, Guitar 1, I mostly bought all the, all the bits um, and, and unmodified, and I tweaked one of them. With Guitar 2, I was going to build the body, because the body's a kind of, you know, a solid, solid body electric guitar. The body is, you know, it's a 2D profile with a few, you know, a few pockets in it. It's not that complicated a shape. So, that doesn't seem like too big a leap. But the other thing I did with Guitar 2, which I would encourage you, is like, with Guitar 1, I wanted the, I wanted the finished product, right? I, want, I had a need, and I was solving that, that problem. With Guitar 2, I didn't need another guitar. I already had the guitar that I wanted. I just built it. Um, so for Guitar 2, I went and found someone else who wanted what I was about to build. So I went to, uh, in this case, I went to my, my brother, who's a gigging musician, and I said, can I build you a guitar? And he was like, of course, awesome. Uh, and so he specced, like, he wanted natural wood, gold hardware, he wanted it to sound good for his particular genre of music, which I call noise. And it's, um, you know, this has two benefits. One is this kind of influence takes you into places you wouldn't normally go and makes you look at things you wouldn't normally look at. Like, his taste is totally different from mine. Uh, if I built, otherwise I'd have probably just built the same guitar three or four times and that would have got very boring. Um, so there's that, but it's also, there are going to be days, no matter how much you love 
what it is that you've chosen as your hobby, you're going to hate it and wish you'd never started. Um, the, you know, you need something to push you through. That's why people have gym buddies, right? It's kind of to give you a reason to still get up on the days you don't want to. Um, and it doesn't have to be a customer in the paying sense. Just find a way to, you know, you could blog about, I'm going to go into this, um, you know, robot pie, pie wars competition or something and give yourself a kind of semi-public or, you know, let your friends know you're going to try for it just to give you, there are days when you're going to hate it and you just want some motivation to get over that. Um, so I bought this uh, nice slab of wood off eBay. Um, I learned how to use the CNC router at Makespace. Um, and I cut out the body using a 2D kind of a vector file I found off the internet. So I didn't learn anything particularly complicated here. I just learned how to use one more tool and, and applied that. And then I end up with this quite nice guitar body, right? I think you know most guitar bodies are fairly plain, uh, this one included, but this one looks quite unique. Um, but I didn't have to stretch myself too much. I learned a little bit more and moved forward. Um, and that would have been good had I not broken my first rule and, slight, and actually tried to move out my comfort zone twice on this guitar. Um, and this nearly undid, undid me, right? Um, the, um, if you go into a guitar shop and find a guitar with gold hardware, which is what my brother had asked for, um, most of them will still have nickel or stainless steel frets. And my brother had asked for bling, and he was going to get bling. So I found a neck that was unfretted. It had the slots in it, so I was still buying the neck, which is quite complicated mechanically, and I didn't have to worry about the spacing of the frets, which has to be reasonably accurate to get the right notes. Um, but I thought, I'd do the fret work. I've watched all these YouTube videos. It can't, I, you know, it can't be that hard. Um, correct. Um, so fret wire is the coil that you see on the left. Uh, kind of, uh, fret wire comes in, it's kind of a kind of mushroom shape uh, as a profile. So you've got the kind of semicircular bit that's on top of the neck, and then there's a descender with some teeth on it that goes into the slots. Um, and you take the hammer there, and you, you know, cut little strips, you hammer them in, um, and they sit home. Um, unfortunately, they're not all level now, because you've just hit them with a hammer. Um, so now, if I don't have them, so, you know, if I tried to play this note, and this fret was shorter than, than the following one, I'd play, I'd go for that, but I'd get that, and my song would probably sound rubbish. Um, so you then cover all the frets with Sharpie, you get a file, um, you file them all down until you see silver, then you take a little rocker kind of bar and you make sure, that, find the places where it's still not quite level, and then you repeat, and this takes half a day or so, um, at which point you've now got a bunch of frets which are all scratched and not round anymore. So then you take another file, uh, which is round, and then you put the, um, the uh, shape back in. But at this point, they're all scuffed. And so if you're kind of doing that kind of thing, you'd hear it scraping. And so at that point, you don't have to polish them. And it, it's, it's, it's quite laborious and tedious. Um, and generally takes me one to two days. And it's very frustrating, and this is where I really wanted to throw in a towel. I had to do it three times to get it right. Um, and each time I got it wrong is because I was impatient and thought I would just do it quickly. And you can't do it quickly, you just have to put in the graft to get it right. Um, but this is where knowing that my brother wanted the guitar saw me through, right? I knew my brother was looking forward to this guitar, and it was worth it because this here is my brother in King Tut's Wawa Hut in Glasgow, which is a fairly famous venue in, in Glasgow, uh, playing to a room of about 200 people with a guitar that I made him. Um, and that, in all the things I've ever, you know, I've been working in software for about 20 odd years, and of all the things I've ever shipped, this is the most proud I have ever been, <laughs> stood in that room watching this gig. Um, I can't tell you, it was worth it. All the swearing was definitely worth it. Um, so, so that's, you know, guitar too. We, you know, so the lesson there is, is the iterative approach is good. Don't try and get ahead of yourself. But it, you know, but set up a structure so that if you do, find a way to keep going um, uh, through those through those tough days because they will happen. So I've now done the fret work. I might as well just make the whole bloody thing. Um, so guitars three and four. The aim was to build the entire entire guitars from scratch. I'm doing two at once here because there's a phase in the middle where you're just applying a coat of stain. Uh, once a day to the body, and then once that's done, a coat of oil once a day to the body. So it makes sense to kind of uh, have have a couple on the go. 
here is the wood. Um, there's a plank of maple and a plank of ash from the local lumberyard. Um, that maple there is this neck here, and this is the body that's from that plank. Um, I took the planks, I chopped them, chopped into four, kind of uh, did the jointing on the edge, glued it um, back to the CNC router. You know, this is all well within comfort zone here now. And now we now have to actually make the neck. So necks are hard. I keep saying this, so let's look at why. Um, so there's two bits of wood on this neck. There's the main bit, and then there's the fretboard. And in the middle is a adjustable metal rod called the truss rod, uh, which you can see in that picture there. And the, what happens on a guitar is when you string it up, the strings pull the headstock this way, right? They, there's, the strings on a guitar are quite uh, high tension, so they are bending the guitar. And the truss rod, as you adjust it, applies counter pressure the other way, which is why if you ever change gauge of strings on your guitar, you should do a truss rod adjustment to try and get the action back to the right um, height. But you've got this constant battle between the strings and the truss rod. Um, so, you know, there's mechanical stuff going on there that you need to get right. The fretboard, you have to get the spacings correct. So here I've got the fretboard with the uh, fret slots on it. I glue it on, um, then do the inlays. And what's happening here, and then carving the neck, where you just take a really brutal file and just remove the bits you don't need. That's all. Just remove the, the excess. Um, it's every time I touch this neck, I'm invested heavily because I started off with a bit of wood. Um, you know, ten pounds for the for the maple. Okay, that's not much. Um, I CNC route it. That's a, a few hours gone. Okay, so ten pounds in a few hours. Uh, put in the truss rod and the fretboard, now getting up to like 40, 50 quid plus it's a day for the glued set, you know, and I'm, this is a hobby, not my day job. So, you know, time's racking up. Now I've got to drill holes in it for the inlays? Come on. Uh, so you, you get to this point, I deferred doing the neck as I came up with so many excuses not to do the neck today. I'll do that tomorrow when I, you know, when I feel less harassed or whatever. And it, you, it's, you know, you just have this in sunk cost that you are never going to get back if you screw it up. And that you just have to get through. And, you know, again, this is where having someone who wants what you're building helps you kind of get over these humps. Um, so I did it. You know, I built, I built my first neck. I was quite pleased. I'd managed to get everything roughly right. It wasn't perfect, but, it, you know, it kind of looked okay. Um, and then I was just finishing touches. I was putting on the tuning pegs here. Uh, first screw goes in at the bottom, fine. Second screw goes in at the bottom, fine. Third screw, as I'm talking it, the head snaps off the screw. So, and there you go. I've just turned, I've, I, you know, I can't put a screw in here anymore. I can't put machine heads in. This neck is now, now useless. Uh, I was upset. Um, uh, but this is, again, where community comes in. So, like a lot of people, I have an Instagram account. Um, I have a separate one for guitars, so I don't bore my, my friends too much. Um, but I post pictures of guitars in progress, and I follow a lot of other people building guitars, professional and amateur. And they follow back because they're doing the same. They just want to see what other people are building and how they're doing it. And in general, the temptation is to post your success. Isn't it awesome? Look at what I built this. Right. And that's what we do, and that's fine. You should, should be proud of your accomplishments. Um, but also, you should post your failures. So I posted this picture, very despondent, late at night. And in the morning, I woke up and found that I had free messages from professional luthiers around the planet saying, oh, don't worry, that happens. Here's what you do. Right. And because I kind of, kind of I don't know, stupid, it felt stupid to do it at the time, but because I you know, got into this community of guitar builders by sharing in progress pictures and what I was doing, this then paid me back when I showed my mistake. People were like, no, it's cool. This happens to you. Um, so they, I got free techniques. So being an engineer, I reproduced the problem. Um, <laughs> and so I, I only have one shot at fixing this, if I'm going to save it. So I got a bit of wood that's got the same physical properties. I put some screws in it. I sawed off the heads of the screws. And I tried the three different approaches. Uh, in the end, I found you can drill to the side of the screw that's lost its head. And if you do it, you can see there's a faint pencil mark of where the machine head is going to be. So I'm doing it on the side you won't see. Um, I was able to drill a hole and wrangle out with some needle nose pliers the screw. And you can see I slipped at one point and gouged the back of the head, uh, which was annoying. Uh, but you know that sands out. Then 
you know, the standard woodworking technique of filling a hole is toothpicks and wood glue. Um, and then at the end, you sand it all down, and then it, this is it. This, if you, there's a dark patch here. I don't know if you can match it to that, but that picture there, this, this neck, this neck failed. Um, and if I hadn't spent five minutes telling you, you'd never know. Which brings me on to the other benefit of having someone who wants what you're doing or is keen to see what you're doing. As a maker, you often just see how far short you fell. Like, I had this objective. I came, you know, close, but it wasn't what I wanted. And so you see a negative. It's hard to see the positives in what you know. Whereas my brother didn't have a guitar, and he then had a guitar, and he thought it was awesome. And, you, you know, I look at this guitar, and I see all the places I went wrong. If you get me later, I can give you a big list. But everyone I've given this guitar to and let them play it, they go, oh, that's awesome. And it's, I, that's why I, I really get a kick out of giving my guitars to people to play, because I then get to see the positive in it. So that's another way. Find a way to make sure you see that positive side, not just the bits where you felt, think you fell short. Um, um, Amp one, I didn't want to build an amp, so technically this is a failure. Um, what I wanted to do was build more guitars, but again, it's simplifying. So having this guitar was the last one I did where I just found the design files on the internet and copied them. Um, what I wanted to do was do my own designs eventually, but 3D modeling is hard. Um, and so again, let's keep it simple. Uh, an amp is a box, right? So, I, so as my first project of 3D design and kind of manufacture, I made a box. Uh, it happens to be a useful box, because this is, uh, I kind of cut it out, and there's an amp. Um, but it's, it's, again, it's the same principle. How can I dump down the problem that I'm trying to solve, or find a stage, you know, a stepping stone on the way? Because then, I now, the next guitar was done in 3D design, and it kind of looks exact, kind of, kind of recognizable. Um, so that guitar there was made in MakeSpace. The wood was done on the CNC router. I laser cut the scratch plate. I 3D printed the controls. And you know, but that's, this has taken me by this point six or seven guitars to get to this point where I'm fabricating. And this is still someone else's design I've copied. This is based on a Fender Mustang. Uh, next guitars will be my own design, but you know, it's taken me getting on for eight, nine guitars to get to that point where I wanted to, you know, in theory, get to all that time ago. So, and, that, and that's, I guess that's, you know, it's, it's very easy to get overwhelmed and disillusioned when you, when you pick up, or you, number of people that come up to me and look at these guitars and go, oh, I could never do that. That's utter rubbish. Um, like, anyone can uh, build guitars to, to misquote Radiohead. Um, this, is, this here is a picture of things gone wrong again. Um, on the low right, you can see where the CNC router suddenly decided my program was rubbish and actually it wanted to uh, cut into the neck. Um, it was kind of some art project, I guess, on the CNC router's behalf. But this is me fixing it manually. And that forced me to learn about templates and routing out by hand, right? Turn your mistakes into a lesson. Um, just how, it's gone wrong. I was very despondent when this happened, but I found a way to learn something from it. So, this is my kind of list of things that I, the rules I try and apply. And if you, I do, if you do project management or kind of engineering of any sort, lots of these will be familiar. Just apply them to your hobbits as well. And it's just, you know, you get to have fun. You get to stand in front of a room full of people uh, with, a, with a guitar that you made, which is a kind of fun, fun sensation. Um, uh, that's, the other thing I do is I write up each week. I have a kind of, I own a blog. I make sure I write up every week what's worked and what hasn't worked and how I think I'm going to going to fix it. Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah, it's, it's kind of a week, weekly scrum rather than a daily scrum, I guess. But again, it's, it's public. I've got people who've written me, kind of sent me emails saying, oh, I had that problem. Thank you for sharing. But it's as much just a tool for me to, I know people are watching it. And if I don't post for a week, they're going to think I've given up. Um, and it's kind of just another structure to try and motivate me to keep going when things really suck. And I say a lot of times they really suck. But the, you know, it's just getting through and enjoying the upsides. And if you want to see pictures of pretty half-complete guitars, uh, then you can go look at my Instagram as well. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? If you have a question, throw up your arm. 
do, I will not do Stairway to Heaven. <laughs> do you want to wind your own pickups? I would love to wind my own pickups at some point, uh, but again, that goes against my rule of incremental. Like, I would love to do everything. Like, I so saw on that, the most recent guitar I built, I say I 3D printed the controls. There's no sane reason to do that. It's certainly not cheaper than buying them, but it is just that kind of incrementally I want to do other bits. I'd love to wind my own pickups, but I'm fortunate enough that, again, yeah, that imposter syndrome, so the, the title is Idiot to Imposter. Uh, yeah, I have imposter syndrome, bad time when I speak to proper people who do this for a living. Right? I do not feel like I'm a, a, a luthier by any stretch. Well, I went to a guitar show and I was chatting to a guy who wounds pickups, and now I, he, he, he saw like a couple, picture of a couple of guitars I don't, and now I get trade rates from him. Um, and it's great, I email him and say, this guitar's gonna do this kind of music and stuff, and he goes, right, I'll wind you some pickups, and you know. And it, so again, it's kind of having the confidence to go out into your community and not be ashamed of what you've built, because again, even though you think it's amateurish, that's not what other people will assume. Um. Anyone else? In which case, a round of applause. <laughs>